I've called this series for the next three weeks Shakespeare in Defense of Good Women because we've had a lot of news about uh, conflicts between men and women in the workplace and elsewhere, in schools particularly. And we've been told all kinds of nonsense about whom to believe and when to believe. And, and we've, we've gone bonkers on the problem of the rule of law. Um, and so I, I thought, well, there are, there are two plays in which Shakespeare has a character, a male character, falling into a terrible jealousy about his wife, in both cases wrongly. Um, and in this case, we've got a, a perfect example of sexual harassment. So I thought I would put them together. And, and, and it also gave me an excuse to talk about these three plays, which um, I, I wanted to do for you and, and for the camera as well. Because as you know, I'm putting these things up on YouTube uh, under the felt, whether it's foolish or not, a felt obligation to, to uh, share what I have to say about these plays. So that's my excuse for the title. Um, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, Measure for Measure was included in a group of plays called the Problem Plays. Um, I once wrote a book saying they aren't problems. It's Shakespeare's problem audience that's the problem, namely us, going into the theater with the wrong expectations. Measure for Measure was one of those plays. Um, so uh, what they meant by problem play was uh, a fluid thing. Um, some people meant there's a, there's a problem in the play for the characters to resolve. But that's true of every play. Um, the more common meaning was that Shakespeare was handling material that he didn't quite handle very well and that he kind of botched it one way or another. The plays in that category were Measure for Measure, All's Well That Ends Well, Troilus and Cressida, uh, and Hamlet. So as you know, I've written extensively on Hamlet. Um, and um, the, my point about Shakespeare's problem audience is that the, if we come to do the plays with the right mindset, with the Shakespearean Renaissance set of expectations, the pl problems disappear. There are no problems of that kind. There's nothing botched in the play. Yes? Well, I just want to mention quickly, I listened to a couple of short lectures, and one of the pro problems that was brought up was that that, that it's supposed to be a comedy, but you can't decide whether it's comedy or a tragedy. OK, so That's I'm going to be problem. So is it a comedy or is yeah. it a tragedy? I'm going to be talking about that. Um, it is a comedy, yeah. because in the Renaissance definition of comedy, it's very simple. It has a happy ending. It doesn't end with violent death on stage. If it ends with violent death on stage, that's almost always a tragedy or a history. Sometimes the, the categories blur, because Shakespeare writes some history plays that are tragedies, like Richard II. He writes other history plays that are just pageants, like Henry V. Um, so, but, but for it to have a, that tragic element, there's got to be violent death on stage, usually at the end. Now, there are uh, there is death in the tragic comedies, sometimes called, like The Winter's Tale. There's a, a child dies in The Winter's Tale. Um, but somebody else who dies, we think, doesn't. So it's, it, it's a very fluid set of categories. And as Shakespeare goes through his career, he does not, he, he, he's aware of the categories and he obeys them generally, but he doesn't limit himself to them. He doesn't make his plays narrow. If he needs to do something, he does. Now, this play is a very serious comedy. But all his comedies are pretty serious. Midsummer Night's Dream is very lyrical, so is Tempest. But Tempest is deadly serious um, with the threat of death. All, all but two of Shakespeare's comedies have a threat of death in them somewhere that has to be avoided. So this play, it's the middle period. It comes uh, right after Hamlet, approximately. 1603 or 4. And it's got tragic elements in it. Um, 
But because it's resolved and ends happily, we call it a, a comedy. Sometimes it's called a dark comedy. I don't think it's dark. I think it's, there's darkness in it, but it turns light at the end, as we'll see. So I want you not to get too caught up on the categories, but just let's see what the play itself is doing. I was just going to say it's, it's a little ironic because Shakespeare himself in Hamlet, he's like naming all the different kinds of plays. He doesn't restrict himself to. But remember what Polonius tragedy. does in that speech when he's mentioning all the, com the, the kinds of plays, tragedy, history, comical, tragical, tragical, historical, comical, pastoral. It gets really silly by the end of the list. And Shakespeare is having fun as I mean, he is listing the categories, but he's also um, uh, pushing beyond them and making fun of, of how some people push beyond them badly, like they try to combine all these things in one thing. Um, most people have tried to force uh, Troilus and Cressida, which is one of the so-called problem plays, into the category of either comedy or um, tragedy. And it doesn't fit. It's not a tragedy. There is violent death at the end, but it's not uh, Troilus or Cressida. So um, I am persuaded and have thought about this and talked about it, that, it, that the, the Troilus and Cressida falls into the category of a satire. It is a play about a world gone crazy, gone wrong, benighted, the whole world on both sides, the, the Greeks and the Trojans. And I've talked about this before, in fact, I think in this room. So, um, but today I want to focus on measure for measure. And um, I will quote Philip Thompson saying, a measure for measure is an ordinary Christian story. <laughs> it's got lots of problems in it if we import them because we don't accept the terms of the play, but uh, the problems don't really exist if we accept, if we come to it with, with Renaissance uh, assumptions. So I want to begin by reading two and a half pages. I hope you won't mind. You know I'm working on a book uh, called a, a Shakespeare Companion for Students. And I recently wrote the essay on Measure for Measure. I'm not going to read you the whole essay, but I thought I would test the first two and a half pages on you as introduction to the play. And then afterwards, when we're off camera, you can tell me whether you think it's any good. Um, and works as an introduction. And then, then we'll open the play and start reading and uh, talking about it sort of speech by speech. So Measure for Measure is one of Shakespeare's greatest plays. Unfortunately, it is also one of his most often mistreated by critics. The good characters have been attacked as problematic and disturbing. And the themes have been obscured by the failure to read the play as a renaissance rather than a modern drama. So let us try to be clear about what Shakespeare is actually accomplishing in this great comedy. Seen properly, it is as deep, uplifting, and healing as anything Shakespeare had previously written. Anyone who has raised children, run a business, joined an organization, taught school, or lived in any way among people, knows that one of the greatest challenges of leadership is to govern with both justice and mercy. The reason is that, there are two, that these two great principles of the moral life are paradoxical opposites. Justice is the principle by which we hold all human beings who are endowed with free will to the unalterable standards of human behavior. To choose to break one of those absolute standards is to open oneself up to retribution and correction, by which justice restores the condition of harmony in the soul and in society. However, since all human beings are fallible and endlessly prone to error, there is an equal and opposite principle that offers the human maker of mistakes a path away from despair, namely the principle of mercy. For as Portia says in The Merchant of Venice, in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy, and that same prayer doth teach us all to render the deeds of mercy. There is a difficulty, however. Perfect justice and perfect mercy are mutually exclusive. 
A parent cannot both punish his child for stealing and look the other way. A ruler cannot both justly put a thief in jail and mercifully let him off the hook. Neither can we pick only one of these principles and safely ignore the other. A parent who justly punishes his child for every infraction, whatever the circumstances, will rear either a fearful wet noodle or a rebel against all rules. A parent who mercifully gives his child a pass, no matter what nastiness has been committed, will rear an antisocial egotist. Likewise, if a leader rules only by justice, none of us would be found free of error and punishments would be constant. But if the leader rules only by mercy, the lack of fear of just punishment invites the multiplication of crimes and society topples. This is what Aeschylus in the play means by pardon is still, meaning always, the nurse of second woe. Hence the paradoxical condition and question of every ruler, how can one rule with both justice and mercy? Over thousands of years, Judeo-Christian civilization, acknowledging the paradox, has established a principle for resolving it. Justice must be tempered with mercy. Or in Portia's words, earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. Tempering, seasoning, modification of justice with mercy, the right measure of each, it's a great solution. But a difficulty remains. How does one rule in this particular case? When is this specific offender to be put into jail and when is he, be, when is he to be let off with a warning? Does it depend on the severity of the crime? The specifics of the crime? The offender's attitude? Mitigating circumstances? All of these considerations enter into the deliberations of a judge loyal to both justice and mercy. No judge but God could ever achieve perfection in the challenge to temper justice with mercy. Judges too are fallible. But the proper tempering must be every judge's goal. And the degree to which that goal is achieved depends on the wisdom and the character of the judge. The challenge is particularly acute when it comes to erotic matters, because eros is one of the most powerful forces at work in human beings, all human beings. And though it involves us in the most private and intimate of interactions, its universality makes it also one of the most potentially positive and negative forces subject to choice and error in the life of a community and of a state. Hence, a state must have laws governing erotic activity. And like the parent, the state and society may stray too far to one side or the other. One state may busy itself too much with sitting in judgment on the most intimate details of bedroom behavior. Another may permit such license that bigamy, adultery, rape, incest, and sexual trafficking go unpunished. But even in a state characterized by a well-balanced legal system, when the justice of reasonable laws runs up against the overwhelming power of erotic desire, to which every man and woman may become subject at one time or another, even a wise judge is especially challenged. Women must be protected from predatory men. And the city must be protected from the corruptions of prostitution and venereal disease. That requires justice. At the same time, like all men, the judge himself is subject to erotic desire and therefore ought to be disposed towards mercy about the sexual behavior of others. How is a judge to temper justice with mercy in governing a city rife with sexual misbehavior? This is the subject of Measure for Measure. Okay, I'm stopping my reading there. And now I want to read the play. I want us to look at what's going on in it and see how it tries to address and resolve this really unlimited, paradoxical human situation. So we're going to be dealing with individual people. We're going to be dealing with judges. We're going to be dealing with the whole city and, of course, the whole city standing for the society of mankind. And the question is, how 
to, to temper justice with mercy in the particular situations that uh, the people find themselves in. So, um, before I continue, I want to remind you of two principles of reading Shakespeare. I do this every time, and, uh, but it's because you've got to have it in the front of your mind. Number one, we're in a hierarchical universe, right? God's at the top, brute matter at the bottom. Everything has its place in that hierarchy. And every attempt to step out of one's place, whether upward or downward, is going to be a disruption, both of the inner self and of the outer society. Um, that is very distinct from our concept of the world, where Darwin and Hobbes and others are telling us everything is in war with everything else for survival and everything's equal. Um, equality is not a principle of Renaissance imagination, but your right place in the hierarchy is. So that's number one. And number two is the doctrine of correspondence, which means any level of the hierarchy can be used for metaphors, mined for metaphors, to apply to every other level. So when Shakespeare wants to talk about a rebel um, uh, earl or thane against a king, he can use the language of um, Lucifer rebelling against God. And vice versa, he can use the language of a rebel against a king to talk about Lucifer rebelling against God. It works both ways. Okay, so just keep those things in mind and I'll try to point them out as we go. The Duke's first word is Aeschylus. Now, those uneducated in Shakespeare's audience would just say, oh, that's an ancient Roman name. Um, but the educated would know this is an ancient playwright who wrote the Oristian trilogy about the nature of justice. And he gives this name to the second in command in the state for when he leaves. And then he says to him, of government the properties to unfold would seem in me to affect speech and discourse, since I am put to know that your own science exceeds in that the list of all advice my strength can give you. It would be ridiculous for me to teach you about government. You've been around and you know about it already. And now, most annoyingly, there are three lines which tell us that there are lines missing. The sentence makes no sense. Then no more remains but that to your sufficiency as your worth is able and let them work. It's gibberish because we're missing some lines. We don't know exactly how many lines and there's no way of recovering them. They're gone from the first folio, um, which is the early text of the play. And that's it. We don't know what Shakespeare wrote. Anybody who's tried to fill it in <laughs> Doesn't sound like Shakespeare. So we don't know what he meant there. In any case, he goes on at line 10. The, the nature of our people, our city's institutions, and the terms for common justice, you are as pregnant in as art and practice hath enriched any that we remember. There is our commission. He gives him the paper from which we would not have you warp. Don't, don't go against it. Now, if... Aeschylus is so smart about politics and government, why isn't he putting the rule into Aeschylus's hands? We don't know yet. Call hither, I say, bid come before us, Angelo. What does Angelo's name mean? Angel, which means messenger. What figure of us, now you remember the royal plural, he's speaking the royal plural because the ruler is two people, he's the embodiment of the state, and he is an individual human being. So he, he, in formal occasions, will use the plural to remind everybody and be formally uh, acknowledging that he speaks as the head of state. For you must know we have with special soul elected him our absence to supply. We're going away, and he's going to take our place. Let, lent him our terror, dressed him with our love. So I want you to remember that Shakespeare is always writing with antitheses. 
opposites. It's how he builds drama, not only characters, this character opposite that one and this scene opposite that one, but in any line almost, he's giving us antitheses, opposites. So what are these opposites? Lent him our terror, terror dressed him with our love. What, in what sense does the duke have terror? Why is that a, a thing that he wields? What does it mean to say he has terror? We've given him our terror. Power. Power. To do what? Whatever he wants. Not whatever he wants. He's still answerable to God. Right? He's got to be just and all the good things that a ruler should be. So he can't just do anything he wants. But what he can do is justly execute someone. Right? Off with his head. That's terror, that's fright for the people. And we've dressed him with our love. So what, is, what, what does the Duke do with love? What's the principle here? Mercy, Mercy. forgiveness. OK. Now, that's not the only time we're going to hear those two. And given his deputation, so deputation, Angelo is going to be the deputy of the Duke. All the organs of our own power, what think you of it? Aeschylus. If any in Vienna be of worth to undergo such ample grace and honor, it is Lord Angelo. So that's telling us Aeschylus, the wise man, the knowledgeable one about government, is announcing that Angelo is the guy for the job, right? And it's also telling us that as far as the public knows, Aeschylus being an example, Angelo is thoroughly virtuous. Enter Angelo. Always obedient to your grace's will, I come to know your pleasure. Angelo, says the Duke. There is a kind of character in, your, in thy life. Character means not just what we mean by it all, though it also means that. It also means reputation. Like uh, you write someone's character, it's like you're writing a letter of recommendation. There is a kind of character in thy life that to the observer doth thy history fully unfold. We can see by your life everything about you. Thyself and thy belongings are not thine own so proper as to waste thyself upon thy virtues, they on thee. Heaven doth with us as we with torches do, not light them for themselves. We don't light torches to light torches, right? We don't want the light of a torch to be lighting the torch. We light a torch to give us light to see other things. And so heaven doesn't give men virtues just to be festering in themselves, they're to be used in the world. Uh, for if our virtues did not go forth of us, we're all alike as if we had them not. In other words, it, wouldn't, it would be as if we didn't have virtue, if we weren't using it in the world. Spirits are not finely touched but to fine issues, nor nature never lends the smallest scruple of her excellence, but like a thrifty goddess, she determines herself the glory of a creditor, both thanks and use. Nature gives us these things because she wants something back for it. So he's using the word nature, and he might easy, as easily use the word God. It doesn't matter if they're both doing the same thing, giving us these gifts, not just so that we have them, but so that we can use them for good, for good reasons. And this is particularly important in a ruler, right? And somebody who's responsible for the common welfare. But I do bend my speech to one that can my part in him advertise. I, as, I'm telling this to someone who can Tell it perfectly well himself, like you know this as well as I do. In our remove, be thou at full ourself. Mortality and mercy in Vienna live in thy tongue and heart. So let's look at those two antitheses. We already know what mortality and mercy are, right? Mortality means... The, the deputy's power or the duke's power to, to execute. And mercy, the opposite. Okay, live in thy tongue and heart. Now, how are we to read that? Is it both live in both? He doesn't mean that. It's a parallelism. Mortality lives in thy tongue and mercy in thy heart. Mercy has to come from the heart. You have to care. Mortality lies in the tongue because he can say off with his head. You with me? Okay. Old Aeschylus, though, first in question, that is, he argues better, like he's wiser, in question means in, in discussion of these matters, is thy secondary. 
So I'm making him secondary to you. You, you are now the power. So Angelo says, now, good my lord, let there be some more test made of my metal before so noble and so great a figure be stamped upon it. What's the metaphor? Whose picture is on the coinage? The Duke. So he's using this, the word metal as a pun. Shakespeare often makes a pun of the word metal. M-E-T-T-L-E, -E, we spell it, meaning you know, what you're made of. And M-E-T-A-L, it comes from the same root, is something metallic, right? You make coins from it. So before you stamp your image on me, test to see that the metal is good. That's real gold or real silver and not pot metal. It um, raises the question, why, why if Aeschylus is higher up in rank, and an ability, why is that's he right. going to be second? It does raise that question. So that's mucking with the hierarchy, I guess? In, no. In part, no. Well, it seems to be, yeah. but we're only at the beginning of the play. So my answer is keep reading. <laughs> but it's a good question because it, it intends to raise that question. You're absolutely right. Why did he put Aeschylus above, why did he put Angelo above Aeschylus? So Angelo says, test me, make sure I'm the real thing. Duke, no more evasion. We have with a leavened and prepared choice proceeded to you, therefore take your honors. I've decided, this has been decided, I've thought about it, and this is what I'm doing. Our haste from hence is of so quick condition that it prefers itself and leaves unquestioned matters of needful value. I'm not discussing the details with you. We shall write to you as time and our concerning shall importune how it goes with us and do look to know what doth befall you here. So I'm going to write you letters, you're going to write me letters, and I'll keep, in tra I'll keep track of what's going on. So fare you well. To the hopeful execution do I leave you of your commissions. Angelo, yet give leave, my lord, that we may bring you something on the way. Let's walk you out of the city. He says, my haste may not admit it. Nor need you on mine honor have to do with any scruple. Your scope is as mine own. So to enforce or qualify the laws as to your soul seems good. Now we've got that antithesis again, right? Enforce the laws or qualify them. That's that justice and mercy. Give me your hand, I'll privily away. Now he says something interesting. I love the people, but do not like to stage me to their eyes. Though it do well, that is, it's a good thing for the leader to show himself to the people from time to time, because it's good that the people should honor him and respect him and see him. Though it do well, I do not relish well their loud applause and aves vehement. Nor do I think the man of safe discretion that does affect it, that really likes it. I don't think the man has safe discretion, judgment, who really loves to be worshipped by the people applauded and aves and so on. So he's telling us something about himself, but he's also giving us a warning about Angelo. What, do you, what ought you really to care about? Care about the things I'm telling you, right? Uh, justice and mercy. But don't worry about your reputation. Don't worry about other people worshiping you. And we're going to see this come around when we get to know Angelo better. The heavens give safety to your purposes, lead forth and bring you back in happiness. I thank you, fare you well. So Aeschylus says, I shall desire you, sir, to Angelo, to give me leave to have free speech with you, and it concerns me to look into the bottom of my place. A power I have, but of what strength and nature I am not yet instructed. Like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I know you're above me, but what am I supposed to be doing here? And Angelo says, "'Tis so with me. I also don't know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. Let us withdraw together, and we may soon our satisfaction have touching that point. I'll wait upon your honor." Out they go. All right. Now, in the New Testament, there are various parables in which a Lord goes away, and then he comes back. Yeah? He gives uh, one talent two talents and five talents to three different people. 
and then he goes away. And then he comes back and he reckons with them. What did you do with your five talents? What did you do with your two? What did you do with your one? So we can already see that Shakespeare is setting this up as a kind of parable. And I want to remind you of what I repeat probably too much, but maybe it bears repeating, that Shakespeare is the absolute master of joining two kinds of drama in one experience. That universal meaning and implication of uh, an allegory or of a kind of medieval morality play that's just talking about something that's true for everybody, like in the play Every Man, which is about every man. And at the same time, making his characters specific and realistic and believable to the extent that we can empathize into them and care about what happens to them, find them interesting or compelling or horrifying or beloved or whatever it is, and make, them, make it matter to us what they say and what they do. He, he makes this wedding of these two things so that everything that gets said in a, in a Shakespeare play from the high period on to the end is both utterly particular and compelling and utterly universally significant. And he comes at the time in the history of drama when that perfect unity can happen, and he's the man for that job. Everything before is a little bit more allegorical or universalizing or morality play-like. And everything that comes after is tending more and more towards slice of life realism so that, you know, you get a play a couple hundred years before Shakespeare named Every Man, and then you get movies and, and plays and I, I, what? Reality TV now with specific people. And the more specific and the more particular and the more we know about their details of who they are, the more real and satisfying it is. So these are opposite styles of drama. And generally, drama has moved from the one to the other, from the, the more universalizing or allegorizing to the more slice of life specific. Shakespeare's at the kind of fulcrum of that, and he's doing both at once. And this is why we, we find his plays irresistible, because they speak to us at both levels of drama. Okay, enter Lucio and two other gentlemen, Act 1, Scene 2. Any questions about what we've said so far? Okay, you still with me? Mm -hmm. Good. Now we're going to the comic subplot. So we get this hilarious gentleman named Lucio, whose name means light, but it, it comes from Lux Lucas, meaning light, the kind of light coming from a light bulb or the sun. But Shakespeare puns on it through the play by making him morally light, like immoral. And of course, uh, Luke's Lucas puts us in mind of Lucifer, the light bearer, who is the rebel against God. Now, Lucio is not a Luciferian character, like he's not, he's not a demonic person like Iago, as we'll find out next week. But he is morally light. And he says, if the duke with the other dukes come not to composition with the king of Hungary, why then all the dukes fall upon the king. Fall upon, meaning attack. So the dukes, uh, if they don't come to a deal, if they don't make an agreement with the king of Hungary, there's going to be a war. First gentlemen, heaven grant us its peace, but not the king of Hungary's. Well, this gets us right into the human problem, doesn't it? Grant us heaven's peace. Let, we want peace from heaven, but we don't want peace for the king of Hungary. Let him suffer warfare, because he's the enemy. Amen, says the second gentleman. Lucio then says, thou concludes like the sanctimonious pirate that went to sea with the Ten Commandments, but scraped one out of the table. He, he went to sea with the Ten Commandments, but he erased one of them. Which one? Thou shalt not steal, says the second gentleman. Aye, that he raised, R-A-Z-E-D. First gentleman, why? T'was a commandment to command the captain all the rest from their functions. They put forth to steal. <laughs> There's not a soldier of us all that in the thanksgiving before meat do relish the petition well that prays for peace. 
we don't really want peace. It's our profession to be fighters. Do you see how the whole history of the world is contained in that line? <laughs> I mean, from the one point of view, there's always going to be war, and there have to be soldiers. We know this perfectly well. And at the same time, the soldier, the good soldier, wants peace as much as anybody wants peace. But they want peace on the terms that allow peace to be harmonious and real, not that allows injustice or violence or terror or whatever to prevail. So there are distinctions to be made. But uh, he's not making those distinctions. He's just saying, we're soldiers. We don't really mean it when we pray for peace. Second gentleman, I never heard any soldier dislike it. Lucio, I believe thee, for I think thou never wast where grace was said. <clears throat> you never had a meal where people said grace before the meal. No, a dozen times at least. What, in meter, in any proportion or any language? I think or in any religion. Lucio, why not? Grace is grace, despite of all controversy. As, for example, thou art thyself a wicked villain, despite of all grace. You're not going to be saved by God's grace. You're hopeless. So he's changing the terms. Um, grace is, is true. Grace is grace, despite of all controversy, uh, regardless of what religion you are or what language you speak in or what proportion. But he's then turning it back on him. Second gentleman says, where there, there went a, but a pair of shears between us. We were cut from the same cloth. You're, you're accusing me, I'm accusing you. You're the same thing I am. And the second gentleman says, I mean, Lucius says, I grant, as there may be between the lists and the velvet. Okay, so you have to know that velvet cloth has two layers, or sometimes three or four, called piles, like the pile of a carpet. Um, very expensive velvet has three or four piles, that is, layers of velvet. But the back, the backing is called the list, and that's what holds it all together. So you can put a shears between the list and the velvet, between the good stuff, the valuable stuff, and the, the, the backing that's holding it together. So yes, we were cut from the same cloth, but you're, I'm the good stuff, and you're the <laughs> stuff we're going to throw away. Thou art the velvet. Thou art the good velvet. Thou art the three-piled piece. OK, so now he's punning on pilled and piled. Pilled means plucked. Think of your, that wool sweater that gets uh, pilt, and you pull them off. Well, the metaphor is now applied to the loss of hair on the head of someone with syphilis. So syphilis was treated with mercury, and sometimes people lost their hair because they were being treated with mercury for syphilis. And sometimes they lost their hair just because they lost it because of the syphilis. In any case, he's talking about, when he says a French velvet, he's talking about the French disease. So he's accusing him of having sexually transmitted diseases, STD as they say now. Do I speak feelingly? And Lucio says, I think thou dost, and indeed with most painful feeling of thy speech, you have a sore in your mouth from the disease. And then he says, uh, I will out of thine own confession learn to begin thy health, but whilst I live forget to drink after thee. So I'm going to drink from the cup and then give it to you to drink, but I'm not going to drink from the cup that you've already drunk from because you're going to transmit your disease to me. First gentleman, I think I've done myself wrong, have I not? That is, I've ended up putting myself in the insulted position. And the second gentleman says, yes, that thou hast, whether thou art tainted or free. Whether you've done yourself wrong by going to a brothel and getting syphilis, or done yourself wrong by allowing him to turn the language to make you the bad guy, in either case, you're in the wrong. So that's the world now of the subplot, this world of soldiers, and fops, and insults, and sexual license, and brothels. And in comes Mistress Overdone. It's a great name. The big joke on it comes later. Behold where Madame Mitigation comes, he calls her. She mitigates men's lust. 
I have purchased as many diseases under her roof as come to, to what I pray? Judge, $3,000 a year, pun on dollars. Aye, and more, a French crown more. Okay, there's the French crown again, the, the loss of hair because of syphilis. Thou art always figuring diseases in me, but thou art full of error. I am sound. That is, I'm solid. My bones aren't hollow. Yes? I have a question. What's the question? The, the line two, three thousand dollars a year, it, sadness, it, it's, not, yeah. it's not dollars. No, it's, but it's a pun. Okay. Dollars and dollars is a pun. Yeah, what, so, I mean, thou, dollars, dollars means... A form of currency back yeah. then? No. It comes from the German taler, taler T-H-A-L-E-R. And it wasn't, a for, it wasn't a common form in England, but they knew about it. And they pronounced it dollars, which is where we get our word dollar. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that was my confusion. Yeah. Okay, so... But that didn't temper the fact that they continued to want to go to the, um, to the brothel. They were willing to suffer a little bit for the pleasure. Yeah, they still want to go to the brothel. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But when he says, I am sound, he changes the meaning. Not as one would say healthy, but so sound as things that are hollow. Like you knock on something hollow, it reverber reverberates. So his bones are empty. That's another image of syphilis. <coughs> Thy bones are hollow, and piety has made a feast of thee. How now, which of your hips has the most profound sciatica? Now he's talking about sexual disease in Mistress Overdone. Well, well, there's one yonder arrested and carried to prison was worth 5,000 of you all. Who's that? Claudio. Claudio to prison? I know tis so. I saw him arrested, saw him carried away. Now, there's a glitch in this scene. You know, this is one of those times you just want a time machine. You want to go back to Shakespeare and say, okay, what did you mean here? Like, why are you doing this twice? It's, there's a, obviously a revision. Because he te she tells us he's been carried off to prison. And in a two seconds, we're going to see him carried off to prison. So it's like Shakespeare couldn't decide if he wanted to tell us that he'd car been carried off or to show us. And he, uh, we end up having both. Um, most of all, agreeing with the proclamation. So we haven't heard the proclamation yet, but we're going to hear it now. So Mistress Overdone says, at line 80, thus... What with the war, what with the sweat, that's the disease, what with the gallows, and what with poverty, I am custom shrunk. I'm losing my customers. Men aren't coming to my brothel anymore. Yonder man is carried to prison, says Pompey. Who's Pompey? You remember Pompey? Defeated by Caesar? So uh, Pompey is the name of her bod. So she, she's a bawd, and he is her pimp, basically. He's the one that brings the Johns into the brothel. Yonder man, that's Claudio, is carried to prison. What has he done? A woman. Get the joke? <laughs> but what's his offense? Groping for trouts in a peculiar river. <laughs> what, is there a maid with child by him? No, but there's a woman with maid by him. So she's no longer a maid because she's with child. So she's now bearing maybe a maid. We don't know whether it's going to be a maid or a, or a boy, a girl or a boy, but we know it's going to be a maid because it'll be a virgin when it's born. And maid could be applied to both boys and girls if they were virgins. You have not heard of the proclamation, have you? What proclamation? All the houses in the suburbs of Vienna must be plucked down. This doesn't mean all the houses. This means all the houses of resort, right? The brothels. But shall all our houses of resort in the suburbs be pulled down to the ground, mistress? Well, here's a change indeed in the commonwealth. What shall become of me? Pompey, come fear you not, fear not you, good counselors lack no clients. Counselors, okay? She counsels them how to get laid, basically. Though you change your place, you need not change your trade. I'll be your tapster still. What's a tapster? A bartender. A bartender. He taps the spigot into the uh, keg of beer, and he taps beer. 
So he's pretending to be a bartender, but what he really is, is the pimp. Courage, there will be pity taken on you. There's the mercy theme. You that have worn your eyes almost out in the service, you will be considered. So she's gone blind because of syphilis. And he makes it seem like it's a virtuous thing to have worn her eyes out in the service. All right, they go out. And now we get the actual Claudio and the provost taking him off to prison. So now we begin to hear what Angelo's doing in Vienna in the absence of the Duke. Fellow, why dost thou show me thus to the world? Bear me to prison where I'm committed. I do it not in evil disposition, said the provost. We're going to find that the provost is a good guy throughout this play, which is rare in a jailer. But from Lord Angelo, by special charge, he told me to show you off to the population. Claudio, thus can the demigod authority. Notice, we've gone from uh, prose to verse. I didn't mention this. We went from verse to prose, and then we went from prose to verse. So in general, always, um, verse is, this is not an absolute rule. This is a tendency. Verse tends to be more serious, more dramatic, more upper class, more universal, and prose tends to be used for the more intimate, the more personal, the more comical, the lower class. Um, those aren't absolute rules. What is absolute is when Shakespeare changes from one to the other, we feel the change. So we feel ourselves going up the scale of creation or down. And here we've gone up. And Claudio is a gentleman. And he's a, he's a more serious character than Lucio and his cronies. Thus can the demigod authority make us pay down for our offense by weight the words of heaven. On whom it will, it will. On whom it will not, so, yet still, tis just. If you've got authority, what you say goes. It's defined as justice. And whether you like it or not, you have to put up with it. It's almost sounds like Thrasymachus in Plato. Thrasymachus taught that justice was simply the will of the powerful. Whatever the powerful said was just, was by definition just for the society. And of course, Socrates goes to great lengths to prove him wrong, that there is such a thing as real justice. But Claudio is complaining that authority can do whatever it wants, and there's nothing we can do about it. We have to call it just. Lucio, whence comes this restraint? So he's probably got his hands tied behind his back. From too much liberty, my Lucio, liberty. As surfeit is the father of much fast, that is, you overindulge, then you have to fast. So every scope by the immoderate use turns to restraint. Our natures do pursue like rats that raven down their proper bane a thirsty evil, and when we drink, we die. Do you know how rat poison works? You have to know how rat poison works. You put poison out for the rat. The rat eats the poison. The rat becomes thirsty because of the poison. The, the thirst makes the rat go for water. As soon as the rat drinks the water, it turns the poison into killing poison and kills the rat. So our natures do pursue like rats that raven down, they gobble up their proper bane, that is the particular kind of poison that works on rats, a thirsty evil. They are gobbling down this thirsty evil, and when we drink, we die. What is he saying about us? Whatever our nature wants and craves and pursues too much to surfeit, to excess, causes us to kill ourselves as a consequence of that activity. So that perfectly describes the diseases we've been hearing about in the previous scene. But in Claudio's case, it's more specific. Lucio's in prose. If I could speak so wisely under an arrest, I would send for certain of my creditors. That's like, that's impressive what you're saying. And yet, to say the truth, I'd as lief have the foppery of freedom as the morality of imprisonment. I'd rather not go to jail. I'd rather be free. What's thy offense, Claudio? 
What but to speak of would offend again? What, is it murder? No. Lechery? Call it so. Provost, away, sir, you must go. One word, good friend. Lucio, a word with you. A hundred, if they'll do you any good. Is lechery so looked after? People are getting arrested and taken to prison for lechery? That's new. Thus stands it with me. Upon a true contract, I got position of Julietta's bed. You know the lady. She is fast my wife, save that we do the denunciation lack of outward order. This we came not to only for the propagation of a, uh, only for propagation of a dower remaining in the coffer of her friends, that is her family or relatives, from whom we thought it meet to hide our love till time had made them for us. But it chances the stealth of our most mutual entertainment with character too gross is writ on Juliet, with child perhaps, unhappily even so. <clears throat> All right, what's the relation between Claudio and Juliet? Are they married or not? They were engaged. They are engaged. And they're I'm just going to read you a little note. English common law recognized two forms of spousals. Sponsalia per verba de presenti, a declaration of both parties that each took the other at the present time as spouse, was legally binding, irrespective of any change of circumstances, and whether the union was, union was later consecrated by the church or not. It amounted to a full marriage. Sponsalia per verba de futuro, a sworn declaration of intention to marry in the future was not thus absolutely binding. Failure of certain conditions to materialize, notably failure to furnish the agreed dowry, justified a unilateral breach. It was this second form of agreement to which Angelo and Mariana were committed, we'll hear about that later, and which Angelo, because of the lost dowry, sought to repudiate. In one circumstance, however, de futuro spousals, became automatically converted into absolute marriage. And that is if he knows her as his wife, meaning if they consummate this agreement sexually. OK. So we're going to see this great parallel between Juliet and Claudio on the one hand and Mariana and Angelo on the other hand. Am I right to assume you've read the play before tonight? Yes? OK. So they made this commitment, and they only are waiting for the dowry to go to church and have it sealed. But it's a legally binding commitment. So that's why he says, she's fast my wife, except that we lack the outward order, meaning the church blessing on it. But we're committed to each other. But she's with child, unhappily even so. And the new deputy now for the duke, meaning Angelo, whether it be the fault and glimpse of newness, or whether the body public be a horse whereon the governor doth ride, who newly in the seat, that it may know he can command, lets it straight feel the spur, whether the tyranny be in his place, or in his eminence that fills it up, that is, it's either the, the uh, position that Angelo's in, or Angelo himself personally, that's the two bodies of the king or the duke. I stagger in. But this new governor awakes me all the enrolled penalties which have like unscoured armor hung by the wall so long that 19 zodiacs have gone round and none of them been worn. For a name now puts the drowsy and neglected act freshly on me. Tis surely for a name. Okay, so here it says 19 years have gone by before, since these laws have been enforced. Later, we're going to hear it's 14 years. It's another mistake in the text. Shakespeare didn't correct it before it went to print. It was probably corrected in the theater, but we don't have the, the prompt book. It doesn't matter. It's a long time. The laws have not been enforced for a long time. And I'm the guy that's exemplifying the new strictness of the law. And I think he's doing it for a name, meaning for a reputation. Well, Lucio says, I'll bet it is. 
So send after the duke and appeal to him. I have done so, says Claudio, but he's not to be found. I pray thee, Lucio, do me this kind service. This day my sister should a cloister enter and there receive her approbation. My sister is about to enter a convent, not as a nun yet, but as a novice on approval. She's going to be proven. She's going to live there and try it, see if she wants to do it and see if they want her and she, see if she can live up to the rule. Acquaint her with the danger of my state. Implore her in my voice that she make friends to the strict deputy. Bid herself assay him, try him, test him. I have great hope in that, for in her youth there is a prone and speechless dialect such as move men. She hath prosperous art when she will play with reason and discourse, and well she can persuade. So she's good at argument. And she can be rational and reasonable, strongly so. Maybe there's hope. Maybe she can convince him not to, to finish me off. Lucio says, I pray she may, as well for the encouragement of the like, which else would stand under grievous imposition, as for the enjoying of thy life, who I would be sorry should be thus foolishly lost at a game of tic-tac. Tic-tac is a game like backgammon, in which you put pegs into holes. So I don't want your life to be lost at a game of tic-tac, but I also want to encourage the like in others. Like, I don't want everybody to start getting put in jail and executed for fornication. That'll, that would limit my scope of pleasures. Okay. Thank you, good friend Lucio. He's going to go to Isabel and... Tell her the situation. Act 1, scene 3. Questions about the scene? Which scene? The scene we've just had? Or the scene? scene we've just had. Yeah, I, I have a question. I thought that Lucio was a, a, a lesser person. He's a gentleman, Claudio. but he's morally lesser. Yeah, okay, because Claudio keeps addressing him as an equal. And yes, and they've been friends, and he's yeah. heard, oh, Claudio, he was supposed to meet me here, and he didn't, didn't show up. So it's very suggestive that, that they are friends, mm -hmm. Lucio and Claudio. And it's suggestive because Claudio's crime is a crime. Like he slept with his wife, his girl before they were married. So there's a kind of self-indulgence in him that has to be grown out of yeah. by the end of the play. And we're going to see that happen. Lucio is at a much lower level, but it's the same story with him. Yeah. We're, going to, we're going to hear about that too. So it's a really good question, what, what's the relation between them? Hold it in mind, because Shakespeare's going to develop them in their separate ways along parallel lines. The speech pattern changes between the two. Yes. Two, so uh, uh, the speech pattern changes because um, Lucio is speaking in prose all this time. Mm -hmm. And that's just another indication of a kind of lower status, lower, status, lower <laughs> level. All right, now, enter the Duke and Friar Thomas. What? We thought the Duke was gone. The Duke's there in the middle of a conversation, and he begins, No, Holy Father, throw away that thought. Believe not that the dribbling dart of love, that is Cupid's arrow, can pierce a complete bosom. I'm not staying here in secret because I've got a love affair going. That's not it. Throw away that thought. Why I desire thee to give me secret harbor hath a purpose more grave and wrinkled that is older and wiser than the aims and ends of burning youth. Friar, may your grace speak of it. My holy sir, none better knows than you how I have ever loved the life removed and held an idle price to haunt assemblies where youth and cost witless bravery keeps. I don't like to hang out in the crowds and the raves and the drinking taverns and the, where, where people show off their costumes and they, you know, they compete for fashion and all that stuff. I'm not into that. I've delivered to Lord Angelo a man of stricture and firm abstinence my absolute plow, power and place here in Vienna. And he supposes me traveled to Poland, for so I have strewed it in the common ear, and so it is received. 
Now, pious sir, you will demand of me why I do this. Gladly, my lord. We have strict statutes and most biting laws, the needful bits and curbs to headstrong, it says weeds, it probably should say steeds, I expect it's a misprint, because you have bits and curbs to steeds, not to weeds. Or it could say wills, like the, the um, wild horse is an image of the, of the will which for this 14 years we have let slip. Remember we said 19 a few minutes ago, now it's 14. Even like an overgrown lion in a cave that goes not out to prey. Now as fond fathers having bound up the threatening twigs of birch, only to stick it in their children's sight for terror not to use, in time the rod becomes more mock than feared, that should be a comma, so our decrees dead to infliction to themselves are dead, and liberty plucks justice by the nose, the baby beats the nurse, and quite athwart goes all decorum. So he's complaining. The, if you use birch twigs to, to beat the children when they're disobedient, and then you hang them up here, and you say, you better do what I say, or it's the twigs, and you always do that, and you never take them down, and you never beat the child, pretty soon, the kid doesn't care about those twigs. He, he doesn't think it's a real threat. So our decrees, dead to infliction to themselves, are dead. I haven't been enforcing these laws, and people aren't obeying them. You know, if the policemen aren't out stopping people from speeding on the freeway, people are speeding on the freeway. Nobody's going to give me a ticket. They haven't given a ticket for this in years. Liberty plucks justice by the nose. Liberty doesn't just mean freedom from tyrannical government, as we mean it. Liberty means excess license, do, disobeying the laws, doing whatever you want, and not, not, uh, not obeying either the social or the legal code. The baby beats the nurse, meaning everything's upside down. The hierarchy's turned upside down. And quite a thwart that is against the grain goes all decorum. Friar says, the obvious, it rested in your grace to unloose this tied up justice when you pleased. And in it, and it in you more dreadful would have seemed than in Lord Angelo. You could have enforced the laws. Why didn't you? It would have been more scary in you. I do fear too dreadful. Sith was Sith means since. Sith was my fault to give the people scope. T'would be my tyranny to strike and gall them for what I bid them do. For we bid this be done when evil deeds have their permissive pass and not the punishment. I've been letting them get away with it. It's my fault. But if I tried to enforce the laws myself when I've been letting them get away with it, it would seem cruel and tyrannical. I don't want them to think of me in that way. Why not? What's his motive? I don't want the people to think I'm cruel and tyrannical. Why? Why? Why does he want them to like him? Why does he need it? Because he wants to be in his reputation. No, that's exactly what it isn't. Okay. And that's the contrast with Angelo. Thank you, <laughs> I set you up, Lori. I set you up. Good job. <laughs> the point is, it's good for the people and it's good for the state for them to be worshipful and admire the prince. In fact, it's a crime to slander the prince, as we're going to see. So it's not for selfish reasons. It's not for egotistical reasons. It's for the good of all, including, uh, I mean, including him, but including the people and the state. And it... He needs them to know that he's good and just and merciful and all the good things so that the state is well founded and established and there's no rebellion. Therefore, he says, indeed, my father, I have an Angelo impose the office who may in the ambush of my name strike home and yet my nature never in the fight to do it slander. He's going to be the one that tightens the grip and nobody's going to blame me. <clears throat> and to behold his sway, meaning his rule or government, 
I will, as to a brother of your order, visit both prince and people. I'm going to dress up as a Franciscan monk. And I'm going to wear a cowl. It's going to hide my face. They won't recognize me. And I'm going to hang out and see what actually goes on. There's a long history of European literature where kings do that, right? They go in disguise and they come into the city to watch what's really going on. Um, <clears throat> even gods do that sometimes. Remember that Zeus and uh, Hermes visited Bacchus and Philemon in disguise, and they treated them well. They treated the gods well, and then they treated Bacchus and Philemon well. So therefore, I pray thee, supply me with the habit, that's the clothing, and instruct me how I may formally in person bear like a true friar. More reasons for this action at my more leisure shall I render you. I'll give you other reasons why I'm doing this. Only this one. Now I'm going to clue you in. Lord Angelo is precise. Stands at a guard with envy. At a guard means en garde, right? His opponent is envy. He's trying to keep envy off. Scarce confesses that his blood flows or that his appetite is more to bread than stone. He hardly will admit that he needs to eat like everybody else. Hence shall we see, if power change purpose, what our seamers be. What is a seamer? Across as one thing, and you want then, but. A poser, right, a pretender, a hypocrite, pretending to be something he's not. So the Duke knows something about Angelo that we don't know, that even Aeschylus didn't know, <clears throat> and he's testing him. So this again comes from the gospel idea of the absent testing master, right? He says he's going to be gone. Let's see what the guys do in my absence. But really, he's not gone, just as God is never gone. He always sees what's going on. So he's going to test him. OK. Questions? Let's see what time it is. Doesn't the roof of an aspirant? I'm sorry? An aspirant that, that Angelo aspires to be good. He's, he's not necessarily pretending. He's, he's aspiring to be good against his nature. Um, well, that's not what the word seamer means. The word seamer means he's seeming to be this when he's not. Mm -hmm. um, and also, he's overboard, right? He's scarcely confessing that his blood flows or that his appetite is more to bread than stone. He doesn't want to admit that he has human foibles yeah. or limitations. That's at least what the Duke is saying about him. Or appetite. Mm -hmm. And we will see that he's right about him when it comes down to it. He is sensing hypocrisy in Angelo beneath his pretense right. of superiority, chastity, purity, etc. Now, Shakespeare will never come out and malign the Puritans directly. Puritans were the enemies of the theater. Um, but Shakespeare has to be very careful because they, the Puritans were in charge of the city. Now, the theaters were outside the city. But they were powerful people at this time. And so he had to be careful about Catholics and Protestants, and he had to be careful about Puritans too. But Angelo is a kind of um, external anyway, not theological particularly, but, uh, but behavior, behavioristical Puritan. Um, and Shakespeare doesn't actually say that, but he's, he is uh, alerting us to the dangers of this kind of hypocrisy. So is the Duke just really trying to set him up because Angelo had asked for a test of his medal before he, he uh, was assigned this job and the Duke said, oh, no need. This is the test, but he doesn't tell him. Yeah. If this is the test. So, but was the Duke then suspicious of something that Yes, he, he was, but we don't know why. Yeah. The Duke was suspicious, but we don't know why. And we're going to find out later why, what, what, he's, what he's going on when he's doing this. Um, he's not telling us either. He's just giving us one hint about the seamer. The actual reasons for his knowledge that Angelo is a fake 
will come out later. All right. Uh, are you up for a break, or do you want me to keep going? Keep going? Nobody needs a break. OK, we keep going. Act 1, scene 4. <clears throat> Isabella, in the convent, says, and have you nuns no farther privileges? None. Are not these large enough? Isabella, yes, truly, I speak not as desiring more but rather wishing a more strict restraint upon the sisterhood, the votarists of St. Clair. Well, the votarists of St. Clair were nuns that followed uh, in an order founded by St. Clair, who was the friend of St. Francis of Assisi. They're the, the female version of the Franciscan friars, and they were famously the most strict of all the uh, orders of nuns. So here's Isabella asking for more strictness. Now why? People have accused her of being prudish and excessive and, and uh, over the top, <clears throat> sort of what Angelo's pretending to be. But look at the city that she's escaping from. We've seen it in Lucio and his friends. It's got brothels. It's got people fornicating and producing children and not taking responsibility for them. It's a threatening society. The laws, everything's going athwart, says the Duke. It's that world that Isabella is trying to leave for protection going to the convent. <clears throat> and who enters in to call her out? Lucio who represents everything about self-indulgence and sexual license. <laughs> Who's that which calls? The nun says, it's a man's voice. Gentle Isabella, turn you the key and know his business of him. You may, I may not. You are yet unsworn. That is, she's not now yet a nun. She's on probation, but she's still um, unsworn. When you have vowed, you must not speak with men, but in the presence of the prioress. That's the head of the convent. Then if you speak, you must not show your face. Or if you show your face, you must not speak. He calls again. I pray you answer him. Peace and prosperity. Who is it that calls? Hail, virgin, if you be, as those cheek roses proclaim you are no less. Can you so stead me as to bring me to the sight of Isabella, the no a novice of this place and the fair sister, to her unhappy brother Claudio? Why her unhappy brother? Let me ask the rather, for I must now make you know that I, I am that Isabella, his sister. So your brother kindly greets you. He's in prison. For what? For that which, if myself might be his judge, he should receive his punishment in thanks. You get it? Lucio is all for fornication and getting with people with child. <clears throat> He hath got his friend with child. Isabella, sir, make me not your story. Don't, don't put me on. Tis true. I would not, though tis my familiar sin with maids to seem the lapwing and to jest, tongue far from heart, play with all virgins so. I hold you as a thing enskied and sainted by your renouncement, an immortal spirit, and to be talked with in sincerity as with a saint. Well... Maybe that's true. Maybe he talks to nuns more politely than he would to girls on the street. But it's, um, he's overboard. And she says, you do, you do blaspheme the good in mocking me. And he says, no, I'm not mocking you. I, I mean it. But she recognizes that this, she doesn't deserve this kind of enskied, saintly, then he says, <clears throat> your brother and his lover have embraced as those that feed grow full, as blossoming time that from the seedness the bear fallow brings to teeming foison, even so her plenteous womb expresseth his full tilth and husbandry. <clears throat> Agricultural images, she's pregnant. Someone with child by him, my cousin Juliet, is she your cousin? Adoptedly, as schoolmates change their names by vain though apt affection, she it is. Oh, let him marry her. 
That's the solution. Don't kill him. Just let him marry her. Make an honest woman of her. Make an honest man of himself. That solves it. They're already committed to each other. All they're doing is waiting for the dowry till uh, they go to the church and get married. Let him go to the church and get married. That'll solve it. Why is he in prison? What, what are the rules about like marrying or not? And can you choose to not marry despite, I mean, obviously uh, Angelo chose not to marry Mar Mariana. I don't want, you know, spoiler alert, but um, you know, why, I mean, Claud Claudio could have chosen to marry Juliet as well. He probably should have. He's not being doubt. allowed to. Yeah, He's but, being put in jail and about to be executed. But before <clears throat> Hand. I mean, before, uh, before, before, got arrested. before she got pregnant, before it was clear that she was pregnant. Or before she got arrested. <clears throat> well, Isabella's point is exactly what you're saying. That, that would solve it. She seems to think that would be fine. Right? Yeah. Let him marry her. Well, this is the point, says Lucio. The duke is very strangely gone from hence, bore many gentlemen, myself being one in hand, in hope of action. But we do learn by those that know the very nerves of state, his givings out were of an infinite distance from his true meant design. So basically, he's arrested him, and his life falls into the forfeit. All hope is gone unless you have by the grace by your fair prayer to soften Angelo. Doth he so seek his life? Yes, he's judged him already. What poor abilities in me to do him good? That's her humility coming out. Essay the power you have. Try it. My power, alas, I doubt. Our doubts are traitors. Come on, come on. Now it's Lucio encouraging her, exhorting her to go back into the world, out of the convent, to make this case for her brother's life. So it's, if you think of it allegorically, here's this pure soul, you know, untainted by the worldliness of the Lucio world, being dragged by Lucio, by worldliness, back to the world to try to save her brother's life. She doesn't know how she can do it. Go to Lord Angelo, let him learn to know when maidens sue, men give like gods, but when they weep and kneel, all their petitions are as freely theirs as they themselves would owe them. Go, put yourself on your knees, cry. Maybe he'll relent. I'll see what I can do. All right, so she tells him she's leaving, and she goes out. Now we have Act 2, Scene 1. Angelo and Aeschylus. They know their jobs now. Angelo's doing his. And now they're going to discuss Claudio. <clears throat> we must not make a scarecrow of the law, says Angelo, setting it up to fear the birds of prey, frighten the birds of prey, and let it keep one shape till custom make it their perch and not their terror. That's that same idea as the twigs. We can't just put up a scarecrow and let them perch on it. We have to mean it. Aeschylus, aye, but yet let us be keen and rather cut a little than dull and bruised to death. It says fall in your text, I think. Um, but it should say dull. I think it's another misprint. It doesn't make any sense, fall and bruised to death, uh, as the opposite of keen. I think the original word is dull. So the antithesis is let us be keen, meaning sharp, and cut a little with a very sharp knife, then use a dull knife and bruise to death. Alas, this gentleman, meaning Claudio, whom I would save, had a most noble father. And then he challenges Angelo. And this is going to come to Angelo, I don't know, ten times in this play. Let but your honor know, whom I believe to be most straight in virtue, that in the working of your own affections, had time cohered with place, or place with wishing, or that the resolute acting of your blood could have attained the effect of your own purpose, whether you had not some time in your life erred in this point which now you censure him and pulled the law upon you. You're a human being. You're a man. You have sexual desire. Might not you have got into the situation that Claudio's in? 
and pulled the law on yourself? In other words, do what? What's Aeschylus asking him to do? Put yourself in his shoes. Put yourself in his position. Have a little mercy. Angelo's response, <clears throat> "'Tis one thing to be tempted, Aeschylus, another thing to fall. <clears throat> I not deny the jury passing on the prisoner's life that is judging the prisoner's life may in the sworn twelve have a thief or two guiltier than him they try. There may be on the jury a thief that's as guilty as the guy on trial. What's open made to justice, that justice seizes. What knows the laws that thieves do pass on thieves? Tis very pregnant, the jewel that we find, we stoop and take it, <clears throat> because we see it. But what we do not see, we tread upon and never think of it. You may not so extenuate his offense, for I have had such faults, but rather tell me, when I that censure him do so offend, let mine own judgment pattern out my death, and nothing come impartial. If you catch me doing the same thing, put me to death. That's the law. Sir, he must die. Aeschylus, his secondary, be it as your wisdom will. See that Claudio be executed by nine tomorrow morning. Bring him his confessor. Let him be prepared, for that's the utmost of his pilgrimage. Aeschylus. Well, heaven forgive him and forgive us all. Some rise by sin and some by virtue fall. Some run from breaks of ice and answer none and some condemned for a fault alone. Here's poor Claudio condemned for one fault. Here are other people running away and not, never getting punished. Look at Lucio. All right, then we have this great comical scene <clears throat> where Elbo, who is... Look, we have to confess that Shakespeare was a practitioner of comical malapropism. He loves the kind of low-life, low-class person who makes mistakes with words. And it's partly because his audience knows the words and ha he, they have so much fun recognizing the errors and, and uh, feeling superior to it. So he knows his audience. He doesn't know our, our audience. And so there are a lot of moderns who just have no patience for this, <coughs> this um, malapropism. But some of them are pretty telling. Elbow says, I'm the poor Duke's constable. My name is Elbow. I do lean upon justice, sir. And bring in here before your good honor two notorious benefactors. Benefactors, says Angelo. Well, what benefactors are they? Are they not malefactors? If it please your honor, I know not well what they are, but precise villains they are. That I'm sure of and void of all profanation in the world that a good Christians ought to have. Void of all pro profanation, all profanity that Christians ought to have. He's mixing up the word prof profanation with profession. <clears throat> Here's a wise officer, says Aeschylus. Why, can you, why dost thou not speak, Elbow? He cannot, sir. He's out at Elbow. Okay, that's a pun, a theatrical pun. Out at elbow means your elbow's pushing through the cloth, right? You're wearing out your clothes. So he's poor. But out in the theater in Shakespeare's time means he's forgotten his lines. He's lost his speech. We say the actor has gone up or the, the forgotten his lines. He's out. When you say the word elbow, he's out of what to say. So he's punning on out at elbow. Okay. You're not guffawing and laughing in hysterics. <laughs> it, you got to get it on the spur of the moment or else it's not funny. So when I explain jokes to you, they're not going to be that funny. When you read it again and you get it, then you'll get a giggle out of it. All right. Uh, what are you, sir? A tapster, parcel bawd, says elbow. Partly a bawd, meaning a pimp one that serves a bad woman whose house was pulled down. How know you that? 
that it was an ill house. My wife, sir, whom I detest before heaven in your honor, what he means is protest. Dost thou detest her, therefore? I say, sir, I will detest myself also, as well as she, that this house, if it be not a bawd's house, it is a pity of her life, for it is a naughty house. How dost thou know that? By my wife. Cordially, cardinally given is carnally given, um, and he names her mistress Overdone. And then Pompey tries to defend himself by distracting people. I'm not going to read all this, but he goes into this whole thing with, with uh, froth. You know what froth is. It's the foam on the top of the beer, right? So the Lord, this, this gentleman is named Froth. He's inherited some money. He's spending it in brothels. He's being taken for a ride by Pompey. And he, he simply distracts everybody. Angelo finally runs out and says, um, this will last out a night in Russia when nights are longest there. Um, at line 128. I'll take my leave and leave you to the hearing of the cause, hoping you'll find good cause to whip them all. I think no less, says Aeschylus. So Angelo goes out. So now he goes through this whole long discussion with Pompey. How would you live? What do you think of the trade of being abroad? Is it a lawful trade? If the law would allow it, sir. Aeschylus, on line, line 218. But the law will not allow it, Pompey, nor it shall not be allowed in Vienna. Pompey, does your worship mean to geld and splay all the youth of the city? Geld and spay. Okay? Like dogs. No, Pompey. Truly, sir, in my poor opinion, poor opinion they will to it then. They're going to do it. If you don't emasculate the men and spay the women, they're going to go to it. If your worship will take order for the drabs and the knaves that is, the prostitutes and the johns, you need not fear the bawds. <laughs> you won't have to worry about pimps if there are no prostitutes and no johns who go to the prostitute. There is pretty orders beginning, I can tell you. It is but heading and hanging. You're in danger of your life. If you head and hang all that offend that way, but for 10 years together, you'll be glad to give out a commission for more heads. You're going to pay people to have kids. If this law hold in Vienna 10 years, I'll rent the fairest house in it after. Thruppence a bay. You, you rent a house by the uh, amount of money per window facing the street. Bay window. So I'm going to rent a house for three cents a bay window in 10 years because there's not going to be any custom. There are not going to be any people to rent houses. Prices will go down. If you live to see this come to pass, say Pompey told you so. Thank you, good Pompey. And in requital of your prophecy, now we're in prose, notice this scene. Hark you, I advise you, let me not find you before me again upon any complaint whatsoever. No, not for dwelling where you do. If I do, Pompey, I shall beat you to your tent and prove a shrewd Caesar to you. <clears throat> in plain dealing, Pompey, I shall have you whipped. So for this time, Pompey, fare you well. Now, what is Aeschylus doing with Pompey? He knows he's a bawd. He knows what he's been doing. He doesn't whip him now. What does he do? Gives him a warning. Gives him a warning, Gives him a warning sends him away. You have a second chance. Angelo didn't do that for Claudio. I thank your worship for your good counsel, he says to him, and then aside to us, but I shall follow it as the flesh and fortune shall better determine. Whip me? No, no, let Carman whip his jade. The valiant heart's not whipped out of his trade. I'm not listening to him. <clears throat> He's going to get caught again. So Elbow's been in his position seven years. They pay him to do it. Uh, do it for some piece of money. Look, you bring me the names of some six or seven, the most sufficient of your parish. And then Elbow goes out, and, the, and uh, Aeschylus invites this other judge who's been sitting in judgment with him, 
whose name is nothing but justice. He's just called justice in the, in the text. I pray you home to dinner with me. Justice, I humbly thank you. Aeschylus, it grieves me for the death of Claudio, but there's no remedy. Justice, Lord Angelo is severe. Aeschylus, it is but needful. Mercy is not itself that oft looks so. Pardon is still, meaning always, the nurse of second woe. You pardon everybody, they go do it again. Just like uh, Pompey just got pardoned. He's going to go do it again. But yet poor Claudio, there is no remedy, come sir. <clears throat> he is compassionate. He doesn't want to see Claudio executed. He had a gentleman for a father, etc. But he understands Angelo's in charge and he sees the reason for it. So he got, we've got justice and mercy here. There doesn't seem to be any reconciliation between them. Provost comes in. He's the jailer. And he says, is it your will, Claude, to Angelo? Is it your will, Claudio, shall die tomorrow? Angelo, did I not tell thee, yea, hadst thou not order? Why dost thou ask again? He doesn't even understand why he's asking again. Why is he asking again? Expects mercy. Hoping for it, too. Yeah. Expecting hope, mercy and hoping for it. <clears throat> Lest I might be too rash. Under your good correction, I have seen when after execution, judgment hath repented or his doom, meaning his judgment of execution. You've, people have executed and then been sorry. Angelo, go to, let that be mine. Do you your office or give up your place and you shall well be spared. I crave your honest pardon. What shall be done with the groaning Juliet? She's very near her hour. That is, she's about to give birth. Dispose of her to some more fitter place than that with speed. Here is a sister of the man condemned desires access to you. Hath he a sister? Aye, my good Lord. Virtuous maid, shortly to be of a sisterhood, if not already. Let her in. <clears throat> okay, now, we have two scenes in which Isabella is talking to Angelo. And there's a, there's a space between them. And the two of them together make this arc of the, the turning point, the climax of the play. So I'm going to try to get in half an hour through those two scenes, and then I will take questions, and then Thursday we'll finish the play. <clears throat> I'm not going to read the whole play, but I'm going to read chunks of it. Who, who's Angela referring to when he says, um, see the fornicatress be removed? Juliet. Claudio's girl, oh, Juliet. Okay. So Juliet was there. Okay. Yep. She's also in prison. Oh, okay. I didn't realize. Okay. Isabella enters. And he says, what's your will? Will is a very interesting word in Shakespeare. Aside from being his name, <laughs> it means free will. It means your willfulness, what you demand or desire or need or want or choose. It also means um, your sexual desire. Will is a word that means sexual desire. And of course, Shakespeare makes puns on a fourth meaning in the sonnets where will means the genitals, sexual parts. He doesn't mean that here at all. It's just that he's asking, what is your will? And there are echoes back to this from later in the play. I am a woeful suitor to your honor. Please, but your honor, hear me. Well, what's your suit? There is a vice that most I do abhor and most desire should meet the blow of justice for which I would not plead, but that I must, for which I must not plead, but that I am at war twixt will and will not. Well, the matter, I have a brother is condemned to die. I do beseech you, let it be his fault and not my brother. Punish the fault, the fornication, but don't punish my brother. Provost, aside, heaven give thee moving graces. I hope this works. 
He doesn't want to see Claudio killed. Condemn the fault, says Angelo, and not the actor of it? Why, every fault's condemned ere it be done. Mine were the very cipher, that means zero. Mine were the very cipher of a function to find the fault whose fine stands in record and let go by the actor. She says, oh, just but severe law. I had a brother then. Heaven keep your honor. And she's about to go out. She sees his point. He's right. You can't not punish the perpetrator of the crime and just punish the crime. She is obedient. She is a virtuous, humble soul. She's accepting the judgment of what appears to be the just judge. Who says, don't leave, him, don't, don't leave so easily? Lucio, the principle of self-indulgence, who wants not to see this punishment happen so that we can all engage in our liberties. Give not or so, he says aside to her. To him again, entreat him. Kneel down before him. Hang upon his gown. You are too cold. Now, the critics will come in and say, yeah, he's right. She's too cold. That's not it. She's just virtuous and simple and obedient. If you should need a pin, you could not with a more tame tongue desire it to him, I say. Now he's speaking as a worldly person, and he's right. She could try a little harder, and maybe it would work, but she doesn't realize that. She just thinks of Angelo as justice. All right, maybe it'll work. So she goes back and says, must he needs die? Maiden, no remedy. Yes, I do think that you might pardon him, and neither heaven nor man grieve at the mercy. I will not do it. There's will. But can you if you would? Look, what I will not, that I cannot do. In other words, my will determines what's possible. But might you do it and do, and do the world no wrong? If so, your heart were touched with that remorse as mine is to him? He's sentenced, tis too late. Lucio aside to her, you're too cold. Too late, why no? I that do speak a word may call it back again. Well, believe this, no ceremony that to great ones longs, meaning belongs, not the king's crown, nor the deputed sword, the marshal's truncheon, nor the judge's robe, become them with one half so good a grace as mercy does. If he had been as you, and you as he, remember I said they're going to keep, put yourself in his shoes? She's doing it again. If he had been as you, and you as he, you would have slipped like him, but he like you would not have been so stern. Pray you be gone. Enough of this. Don't put me into position of being like him. I would to heaven I had your potency, and you were Isabel. That is, let us change places in imagination. Should it then be thus? No, I would tell what twere to be a judge and what a prisoner. Lucio aside, I touch him, there's the vein. Angelo, your brother is a forfeit of the law, and you but waste your words. Alas, alas, says Isabel, why all the souls that were were forfeit once. And he that might the vantage best have took found out the remedy. What's she talking about? I'm looking for an image. I'm not seeing it because Lenore has taken it over. <laughs> there are images in hers too. I'm just trying to find one. Anyway, I don't see it. Last time I taught in here, there was a big cross behind me and I could just do that. What's she talking about? All the souls that were were forfeit once, and he, God, that might the vantage best have took, found out the remedy. The sacrifice of Christ remedies the sins of men. How would you be if he, which is the top of judgment, meaning God, should but judge you as you are? Oh, think on that. And mercy then will breathe within your lips like man you made. Now, that's the Isabel we heard about, who can argue well, right? Be you content, fair maid. It is the law, 
not I, condemn your brother. Were he my kinsman, brother, or my son, it should be thus with him. He must die tomorrow. Okay, so it sounds kind of noble. Even if he were a relative, he'd have to die because that's the law. But the law is a law. It's not, it, the law has to be administered. It has to be imposed and it has to be modified or qualified. That's what Angela was given in the beginning, right? So to enforce the law or qualify the law. He's not qualifying it. He's only enforcing it. But he says he must die tomorrow. And that gets her. Tomorrow? Oh, that's sudden. Spare him. Spare him. He's not prepared for death. Even for our kitchens, we kill the fowl of season. Shall we serve heaven with less respect than we do minister to our gross selves? Good, good, my Lord, bethink you. Who is it that hath died for this offense? There's many have committed it. Now, she's not for fornication, but she's for mercy. Lucio, I well said. <laughs> well, what's he for? Yeah, he doesn't care about mercy. He cares about fornication. Angelo, the law hath not been dead, though it hath slept. Those many had not dared to do that evil. If the first that did the edict infringe had answered for his deed. Now tis awake, the law meaning, takes note of what is done, and like a prophet looks in a glass that shows what future evils, either new or by remissness new conceived, and so in progress to be hatched and born, are now to have no successive decrees, but ere they live to end. All right, so if someone had punished Claudio, someone like Claudio back then, this wouldn't be happening now. But since now the law is awake, we're punishing Claudio, and that prevents future people from committing the same sin or crime. Yet show some pity. <clears throat> I just want to point out that when Shakespeare ends a speech with a half line and begins the next speech with a half line, it's one iambic pentameter line. And it, it's a way of indicating that, the, that they come close on each other. They're right together. So there's many have committed it, I well said, up above. And, but ere they live to end, yet show some pity. She jumps right on it. I show it most of all when I show justice. For then I pity those I do not know, which a dismissed offense would after gall, and do him right, that answering one foul wrong lives not to act another. So I'm pitying those in the future who aren't going to do this because of his example, and I'm preventing him from doing it again to someone else. Be satisfied. Your brother dies tomorrow, be content. So you must be the first that gives this sentence, and he that suffers. Oh, it is excellent to have a giant's strength, but it is tyrannous to use it like a giant. Lucio, that's well said. Could great men thunder, as Jove himself does, Jove would ne'er be quiet. For every pelting petty officer would use his heaven for thunder, nothing but thunder. Merciful heaven, thou rather with thy sharp and sulfurous bolt, that is the lightning bolt, splits the unwedgeable and gnarled oak than the soft myrtle. But man, proud man, dressed in a little brief authority, most ignorant of what he's most assured, his glassy essence, that's the invisible soul, like an angry ape, plays such fantastic tricks before high heaven as makes the angels weep, who with our spleens, that is, if the angels had our spleens, would all themselves laugh mortal. That is, they would laugh themselves into being mortal. They would laugh themselves to death they would laugh themselves mortally. Lucio, oh, to him, to him, wench, he will relent. He's coming, I perceive it. Provost, pray heaven she win him. She goes on. We cannot weigh our brother with ourself. Great men may jest with saints, tis wit in them, but in the less foul profanation. 
Thou art in the right, girl, more of that. That in the captain's but a choleric word, which in the soldier is flat blasphemy. Why do you put these sayings upon me, says Angelo? Because authority, though it err like others, hath yet a kind of medicine in itself that skins the vice of the top. Go to your bosom, knock there, and ask your heart what it doth know that's like my brother's fault. If it confess a natural guiltiness such as is his, let it not sound a thought upon your tongue against my brother's life. That's the tongue and heart that we heard in the beginning. Knock in your own heart. Is there any potential in you for lustful feeling? If so, have mercy on my brother. Angelo, aside, that is to the audience, but not in her hearing, she speaks. And it is such sense, it's such good sense, that my sense, meaning my physical senses, breed with it. Whoa. Very well. Gentle, my lord, turn back. I will bethink me. Come again tomorrow. Giving her another day. I'll think about it. I want you to come again. Hark how I'll bribe you, bribe you good my lord. Turn back. He turns on her in a fury. How? Bribe me? I thought that was hope. <laughs> Who is this Angelo? I'm Mr. Virtuous. What? You're trying to bribe me? Are you crazy? I'm Mr. Pure. Aye, she says, with such gifts that heaven shall share with you. Lucio, you had marred all else. It's a good thing you mean that, and not a real bribe. Not with fond sickles of the test of tested gold. Sickles is shekels. It's a form of the word shekels. Not with fond sickles of the tested gold or stones whose, rare, whose rate are either rich or poor as fancy values them. Not money, but with true prayers that shall be up at heaven and enter there ere sunrise. Prayers from preserved souls, the nuns. From fasting maids whose minds are dedicated to nothing temporal. Well, come to me tomorrow. Lucio, go to, tis well away. Heaven keep your honor safe. Amen, says he, for I am that way going to temptation where prayers cross. Prayers are keeping me safe. I'm going that way to temptation that goes across, athwart the prayers. At what hour tomorrow shall I attend your lordship? At any time for noon. Save your honor. Save your honor, meaning God save your honor. She goes out, but he hears her say, save your honor, and he says, from thee, even from thy virtue. Now we have one of these great soliloquies that Shakespeare invents to tell us the inner life, the inner thought of the person. We are always to take soliloquies as honest ref uh, representations of the thought of the person. He's not lying to us in soliloquy. He's telling us what he really thinks. What's this? What's this? Now, this is not just a soliloquy. It's an inner debate and an inner questioning. Is this her fault or mine? The tempter or the tempted? Who sins most, huh? Not she, nor doth she tempt. But it is I that lying by the violet in the sun do as the carrion does, not as the flower, corrupt with virtuous season. The sun makes the flower grow, but carrion, that is dead meat, rots and, and corrupts away. So I am not like the flower growing under the basking of her sunshine virtue. I am like the rotten meat. Can it be that modesty may more betray our sense than woman's lightness? Can it be that a modest woman betrays our sense, meaning our sensation, our physicality, our desire, 
more than woman's lightness, lucio means light, more than moral lightness in a woman. Having waste ground enough, shall we desire to raise the sanctuary and pitch our evils there? Oh, fie, 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 what dost thou, or what art thou, Angelo? Dost thou desire her foully for those things that make her good? What's the answer? Yes. yes. Oh, let her brother live. Thieves for their robbery have authority when judges steal themselves. Remember, he gave us that whole thing about, you know, there might be a thief in the jury, but if he's not arrested and tried, we don't know it. So, but now he's saying thieves, uh, thieves for their robbery have authority when judges steal themselves. What? Do I love her that I desire to hear her speak again and feast upon her eyes? What is it I dream on? Now, watch what he says. O oh, cunning enemy, that to catch a saint with saints dost bait thy hook. Who's the cunning enemy? The devil. Lucifer. Satan. And what is the devil trying to catch by baiting his hook with a saint like, Eliz like uh, Isabel? His soul. his soul. And what does that say about how he thinks of himself? That he's not so virtuous. No, he's calling himself a saint. I think he's calling himself oh, I, a saint. I thought I, my saint. interpretation is that he feared that he wasn't a saint. That he... Okay, fine. It's the same thing. He's imagining that the devil is using Isabella to catch him and turn him from a saint to a sinner. But if you know and you are saintly, then you're not going to be. Correct. So, so, so he doesn't consider himself necessarily. No, I think he has thought of himself as a saint pretending to be good, but not admitting that he's not a saint because he's got these desires like anybody else. In any case, the image is the devil is baiting his hook to catch Angelo with goodness. He's baiting his hook with goodness to catch a saint. Most dangerous is that temptation that doth goad us on to sin in loving virtue. Now, never could the strumpet with all her double vigor, art, and nature, that is the strumpet, the whore, with art and her nature, her natural beauty and her makeup, <coughs> once stir my temper. I could not be moved by the prostitutes in the street. They don't touch me. But this virtuous maid subdues me quite, <clears throat> quite meaning entirely. Ever till now, when men were fond, I smiled and wondered how. So what's just happened? He's, he's fallen for her. He's got lust in his heart. He's got lust in his heart because of her virtue. virtue. It's precisely that that, that attracts him. So the contradiction is fierce, and he is surprised by it, and amazed by it. And all those things that we're saying, go to your own bosom, knock there, see if ever you felt, he's going, no, that's not me, I've never felt, I'm, not, I'm above that. And now, pow. So the next scene is act two, scene uh, three, and Juliet comes in the prison and the Duke comes in dressed as the friar. So now we're seeing him, you know, pretending to be a friar, hanging out in the prison. And he makes, he asks her whether she's repentant. And she is. And uh, he says, are you repentant just because you got caught? And she said, no, I really see that it was wrong to sleep before we were married, sleep together before we were married. And then he says, then was your sin of a heavier kind than his? Now all the modern egalitarian feminist are going to be up in arms, no fair, it's just as much his fault as her fault. But you have to remember that this is a world in which um, men are expected to be aggressive and animalistic, and women have to be chaste. And the men cannot, except in the case of rape, of course, the men cannot have their way if the women succumb. So strength in a woman protects the virtue of men. And this is a microcosm of a universal principle, which is that men are civilized by the love of women. If, if women 
hold to chastity, then men behave themselves and they end up marrying them and taking care of them and helping to raise the children. If women are not committed to chastity, the men get their way with the women and off they go. And that's why in modern America we have so many unwed mothers and bastard children right now that the society is being destroyed by it because we have pretended that we can get away without chastity as a value. Or very few children at all. Right. Okay, so um, the Duke says, she, she agrees with that. And the Duke says, "'Tis meet so, daughter, but lest you do repent as that the sin hath brought you to this shame, which sorrow is always toward ourselves, not heaven. And she says, I do repent me as it is an evil and take the shame with joy. Okay, that's good. And she finds out he's going to die tomorrow. Oh, injurious love that respites me a life whose very comfort is still a dying whore. She's going to have this child and she's going to stay alive because she can have, she's going to have the child. But her life will be a horror because Claudio will be dead. All right, now we come to the second scene. Um, I don't know how far I'll get in it, but let's go as far as we can. Angelo, in soliloquy. When I would pray and think, I think and pray to several subjects. My mind is divided. Heaven hath my empty words, whilst my invention, hearing not my tongue, anchors on Isabel. Heaven in my mouth, as if I did but only chew his name. Shakespeare could not, because of the Puritans and others, use the word God in plays at, for various periods. Uh, sometimes it appears, but usually not. So he very often substitutes the word heaven, where he might write God, and the censors would say, you can't say that, you have to say heaven, or the equivalent. So heaven in my mouth as if I did but only chew his name, and in my heart the strong and swelling evil of my conception. The state wherein I studied, that is, government, is like a good thing being often read, grown seared and tedious. I'm sick of studying government. Yea, my gravity, my seriousness, my gravitas, wherein let no man hear me, I take pride. Bingo! That's the revelation. It's his reputation. It's his reputation for gravity, for morality, for seriousness. Could I with boot change for an idle plume which the air beats for vain? I give it away for an idle feather. Boot, meaning booty, like advantage. Oh, okay, okay. It doesn't mean a physical boot. Think of a pirate yeah, yeah. capturing booty. Um, bootless, doth not Brutus bootless kneel, Caesar says, meaning fruitlessly or uselessly kneel in Julius Caesar. I could change my pride, my, my uh, gravity, for an idle plume, oh place, oh form, that is my position in the world, my reputation, my, my authority. <clears throat> How often dost thou with thy case, meaning outside, thy habit, your clothing, wrench awe from fools and tie the wiser souls to thy false seeming. There's that word again. Blood, thou art blood, right? The desire in the flesh, the desire of the blood is still what it always was. Let's write good angel on the devil's horn. Tis not the devil's crest. You can write good angel on the devil's horn if you want to, but it's not his true coat of arms. He's not a good angel. Enter Isabel. Or no, he, she's announced. And then he says, because she's announced, teacher of the way, then he says, oh heavens, why does my blood thus muster to my heart, making both it unable for itself and dispossessing all my other parts of necessary fitness? All the blood is rushing to his heart, pound, 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 pound. Only not the only place it's rushing. Or the only place. Sorry. <laughs> Leave it to Susan to come up with the... Uh... <laughs> 
So play the foolish throngs with one that swoons. Come all to help him and stop the air by which he should revive. Even so, the general subject to a well, the general, meaning the people, subject to a well-wished king, quit their own part in an obsequious fondness crowd to his presence, where their untaught love must needs appear a fence. That's the same image the Duke used before. I don't like to show me to the people and have them all rush around me, praising me. And he's saying, people rush to the king to be around him and, and praise him and worship him, but they're, they're cutting off his air and doing offense to him in doing that. And that's what's happening to my blood. It's, it's rushing all to my heart and, and uh, turning everything upside down as a result. All right, I think I'm out of time, I am. So we're gonna stop there at line 30 when Isabella comes in. Um, I'll, I'll stay a couple minutes and take questions if you have them. What we'll do next Thursday is finish this scene. And I'm, I'm not going to read. Uh, I'm going to read the scene with Isabel and her brother. Um, and then we'll skip fairly lightly over the various plot elements till we get to the final scene. And then we'll read the whole last scene where it all comes together and gets resolved. Because as I told you, it's a comedy. <laughs> So it's going to have a happy ending. <laughs> Ask me questions. Yes? So this was written in the year of the plague? Uh, there were plagues on and off in England at various times. This was the, the big plague, though, wasn't it? Well, I don't know what you mean by bubonic big. Plague. Yeah, the, the great bubonic plague was much earlier. It was 1348. But it kept coming back. Yeah. And London would close the theaters very often in the summers. Um, so uh, when Shakespeare, re when they closed the theaters in the summers in certain years, Shakespeare would retire maybe to Stratford or wherever and write plays. And then he'd come back to town when they reopened the theaters and they'd perform. them. So plague is always a theme in the background. That's true. Yeah. And what year did um, Elizabeth die? And, um, 1601. Oh, so. Or was it 1603? 1601. So James is newly. James is the new is James is king, and but actually the duke that. is. There are qualities in the duke that are patterned on King James. J king James wrote a book about um, about these these issues of justice and mercy, and um, and there are some echoes in the play. The scholars show various echoes in the play. It's not a literal depiction of him, but it's themes that he was interested in. Uh, later, uh, Shakespeare writes Macbeth, which is explicitly um, talking about witches. And uh, James had written a book about witches, witchcraft. He was very opposed to witchcraft of all kinds. Um, and so that theme in Macbeth is also kind of pleasing to him. Um, there's a theory that Sir Thomas More, the play in which Shakespeare had a hand, was never acted because in it there was, it was an earlier play before James, and in it there's a kind of anti-Scottish set of passages about a Scotsman who's bad. And, and the theory is that they could never perform the play because they didn't want to insult the king, who was a Scotsman. Because he comes down from being James VI of Scotland to become James I of England. So there's a lot of historical stuff if you go into it. And um, that's not my mission. My mission isn't to <clears throat> unpack every detail of the play and show you where it's rooted in, in the historical or literary record. That's the footnotes in the Arden edition if you want to do that. And <clears throat> it's always fascinating. But um, Shakespeare meant his play for us, not just for the historical scholars. So. Uh, if you're interested, I'll help you find where to learn more. But the most important thing to me is to get you to understand the point of the play and the experience of it and its poetry. And so that's, that's where we'll focus our attention. I don't think you'd sit through me going through all those details <laughs> <laughs> for two hours. <laughs> all right. See you Thursday. Thank you, dear ones. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure, my pleasure. <laughs>